So I'm very honoured honored to be the president of SMS Toy Matahaura, your union. I welcome again people to the first SMS annual conference that has been host that is hosted entirely virtually. It's a shame that we cannot be together in person today to renew old acquaintances and make new ones, and the reasons for why do not need any explanation. Um, and being virtual will obviously affect the energy that we usually get from meetings and the dynamics of the meeting. And while I don't presuppose that I shall receive a round of applause for anything I say, I do think that I'm actually about to learn the true meaning of the Zen Cohen, what is the sound of one virtual hand clapping? SMS Toy Matahora, led by our executive director, Sarah Dalton, has achieved much in the last 12 months. You will hear more detail from the presentation of the annual report later this morning, but I would like to reflect on a few aspects of this year and try to look ahead to 2022. I think the progress SMS has made is even more laudable, given just how much coronavirus and has upended all previous operational norms in New Zealand. And spoiler alert, I, I will be returning to COVID later in my address. There's been a fair amount of change in our branch and executive leadership since last year, at the end of the previous term, the start of a new one. We have three new members uh, on the executive and many new branch officers, and they're all shown here. In addition, we have four people for whom we need to acknowledge their work on the executive. From left to right, Murray Barclay, Annette Van Zeist Youngman, Paul Wilson, and Angela Frischini. Angela is an anaesthetist at Tyrafferty DHB and actually stepped down a little over a year ago, but I'm advised that we did not acknowledge this at last year's conference. I offer my apologies to her for this. Annette Van Zeist Youngman is a forensic psychiatrist at Waikato DHB and will shortly be moving back to the Netherlands. Both colleagues joined the executive in 2018 and had been branch presidents for the six years prior to this. We also have Murray Barclay and Paul Wilson, who between them have a total of 30 years of national executive service. Paul served on the executive for 22 years until the end of March this year, and we shall hear more about that later in the meeting. Murray Barclay was elected to the executive in 2013 and was our president from 2018 to 2021. At the moment, our restrictions means that we are not able to acknowledge the work done by these colleagues um, for ASMS and for, for all our members but we intend to do so when we can meet next year. That said, wherever you are currently, and I'm going out on a limb here, wherever you're viewing the conference from, I would ask you to join me briefly in showing your, your appreciation, and clearly you're on your honour. <laughs> That's probably enough, isn't it? Whoops, a daisy. So in April, I took over as president of ASMS, Toi Mata Haora, and I stood for the presidency on the basis that I wanted to be more involved with the vital work that the union does for senior dentists and doctors in New Zealand, and to contribute to the important voice that ASMS has in the Health New Zealand landscape. But if I'm totally honest with you, also, as I've got older, I want to stand up against the managerialism that DHBs increasingly operate by a command and control ethos with minimal, minimal effort towards engagement with the dental and medical staff, and I think a denial of just how much goodwill is needed to keep our clinical services going. So no power without accountability, I think, is a motto that many health organisations would benefit from following. And I can only hope that after the, the entropy of clinical care that, will, that inevitably comes from managerialism, this will be reversed with the advent of Health New Zealand. Enough of my midlife crisis for now. I've come to see the role of president as like that of a ship's captain. I'm responsible for the overarching vision of our destination, and along with the national executive and the executive director, we plot our course and circumvent any dangers we encounter along the way. And in the last eight months since we've become president, we have had to deal with doldrums, with the mecha negotiation, whirlpools, which I see as the transformational change with Health New Zealand and the Maori Health Authority, and even a terrible monster, and that would be COVID, of course. And I doubt we've seen the worst effects of these yet. The next 12 months, as I shall discuss, has all the makings of being an even more turbulent time than the last 18 months. And if I may ring even more out of my nautical analogy, despite all these hazards, the SS ASMS 
is, I believe, a fundamentally solid and seaworthy vessel with an experienced and dedicated crew who all share in the mission we are on, a mission to make healthcare in New Zealand as good as possible and to best serve the people of Aotearoa, Tangata Whenua, Pacifica peoples, Pākehā, and everyone else who over time has made New Zealand their home. I would like to make some I'd like to make some observations about each of these obstacles that we face. The MECA negotiations started in February and were led by Lloyd Woods and by Murray Barclay as co-advocates. Lloyd and Murray were our co-advocates at last year's negotiations, which were cut short just before the first lockdown started. But nonetheless, they actually secured our members a 1.9% pay rise. And we were the only healthcare union to get a pay rise last year. Unfortunately, this year was different. Within a month or so of the resumption of negotiations in March, the government announced that there would be a pay freeze for all public sector workers, earning a pay rate equivalent to $100,000 a year. And the DHBs resolutely struck, stuck to a mantra of no pay rise for the highest paid workers on the basis that this would close the pay gap between richest and poorest pay. Now, as an aside, I find it quite curious that unlike ASMS, no DHB has signed up to the Living Wage Initiative, and as far as I can tell from Google searches, none appear to have issued any public statements about adopting a low-wage policy. So, you know, it's, it's almost as if adherence to a close-the-pay-gap argument might just be a convenience for the DHBs to hide behind. I'll let you be the judge. So some of our cheaper claims earlier on were agreed. We were also repeatedly offered the opportunity of projects and initiatives to assess the current issues of workforce shortfall, but as part of an overall MECA settlement. And given that these are responsibilities that any good employer ought to be doing anyway, we did not accept these as part of the basic terms. But there was no movement on our, fair, on our pay claims at all, and so, to return again to my sailing motif, in early June we lost what fair trade winds we had and found ourselves in the still waters of the Sargasso Sea. The becalming of the negotiations resulted in ASMS calling for stop works for all members, the first time since 2009. And here, I must give credit for all the time and effort put in by Sarah and all the staff at ASMS, and to my executive colleagues for attending as many meetings as they were able to. Following the stop work meetings, we held an indicative survey of members for how to proceed, and the survey results did not give us a clear mandate for any specific course of industrial action. And within a few days of the last stop works, the Delta variant arrived in Devonport. At the same time as the stop works, Sarah had been pursuing other diplomatic avenues away from the bargaining table. And from September, Natalie De Vries, Andrew Ewan, Sarah and myself have been meeting regularly as part of a group called the Futures Group that the minister referred to. That also includes Kevin Snee, who's the Waikato DHB CEO and lead negotiator for the CEOs for the Mecca. Dan Coward, who is general manager of program management at Canterbury DHB. And Andrew Norton, who is head of HR for the transition unit. This group is to undertake work around developing uh, workforce well-being champions with paid time, paid FTE for that. Uh, we're looking at a means to benchmark for staffing need in hard-pressed specialities, and in the pilot discussions, we are considering looking at ED, obstetrics, and psychiatry. And also to explore how to provide IT support, perhaps on a site-by-site -site or service-by-service -service basis, to really address the numerous problems we all encounter from a dated and dilapidated IT system. Again, at the outset, it was agreed that these processes will not be part of the, or dependent upon the MECA settlement, and will be a separate parallel uh, initiative. But recently, there's again been further suggestions from the other side of the table at negotiations to say that we might like to look at subsuming these back into one great uh, lump again. To which I say, yeah, nah. We've also recently had three days of mediated negotiations. Steve Hurring, ASMS Senior Industrial Officer, and I have now become the co-advocates. And again, on behalf of all the membership, I sincerely thank Murray and Lloyd for all the hard work, and believe me, it's been a lot of hard work, that they've done with negotiating for last year and this year. After the mediated bargaining by a mediation team subset of our overall negotiating group, we're currently seeking further bargaining and technical meetings with TAS. And again, there will be an update later. 
To turn to Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority, the announcement of these new commissioning and service provision bodies was very much supported by SMS and its members, and the need to address the long-standing systemic racism that exists in the provision of healthcare in New Zealand has been self-evident for a long time. And that those who oversee health care provision at a national or district level have, been, have failed for a long time to make any significant inroads into what is, I think, a shameful, shameful inequity. And I've yet to meet anyone who does not fully support the principles and aims of this comprehensive healthcare revision. But my obs observation, however, is also that our members have many questions about exactly how this new commissioning and employment body will address the problems within our health system and how members' work plans uh, or patterns may be altered. And again, I think the Minister's comments will help to inform that, but I still think there's a lot of questions. I think additionally, simply corralling existing services under a nominal regional or national banner will not be a panacea for the pre-existing underfunding of services in certain geographical areas and inadequacy of accessibility to these services. Current secondary and prospective tertiary services must be coordinated with one another and be identified for capacity, de capacity development wherever necessary. Without improvement in workforce numbers, not just of dentists and doctors, but nurses, allied health professionals, community support personnel, clerical staff, and, and yeah, even managers. I can't see how we can properly address the health needs of those who are currently being badly let down by the system. And without these factors being addressed, I think any higher moral or aspirational values of the HNZ MHA changes risk being undercut by a very simple reality. In addition to the fundamentally important goals for patient care, HNZ MHA also creates significant novel challenge for ASMS with regards to the lapse of our current MECA, affecting terms and conditions for future new SMO and SDO employees. And in addition, however, the move from multiple employers to a single employer also raises some interesting paradoxes. There are some members who are routinely embattled with their line managers over matters that are clearly clearly endorsed by the MECA, um, uh, and those members should find that they no longer have to fight every step of the way to access workplace rights that have been agreed within the, by the DHD. But some members have managers who offer a more supportive interpretations of the MECA, and they may well find that some of the flexibility that they currently have will be lost with a single employer. This existing broad variation in both inter- and intra-DHB customer practice for adhering to the MECA is something that ASMS is acutely aware of, and we have begun a process of planning for how we ensure fair uplift of members without, uh, fair uplift of members without disadvantaging others. And of course, in an ideal world, we would like to have a ratified MECA in place before the new HNZ MHA regime begins. ASMS is currently facing glacially slow responsiveness from the other side over progressing further negotiations. And in addition, we have the impending dissolution of the DHBs and commencement of HNZ, MHA, and COVID finally reaching our shores, and no doubt impinging significantly on our health system. Within this context, it is my job and that of the executive to anticipate possible risk to ASMS in the next 12 to 18 months and plan accordingly. And in 2022, I expect our strategic planning will need frequent and repeated review and finessing as the full effects of the pandemic unfold. Now, not directly related to COVID, or Mecca, or Health New Zealand, but something which is nonetheless extremely important to us as an organisation is the work on an equity culpapa that we have embarked upon, and which the executive has agreed will include specific representation within ASMS for Māori members. This is a first for ASMS, and I think this work will be a significant landmark in the maturation of ASMS as a representative organisation. And I'm very much looking forward to working alongside all the stakeholders as we continue this important work. And so, back to COVID. As the infection becomes more prevalent in New Zealand, we must be grateful, I think, that the government has pursued a policy of 90% double vaccination for New Zealand as a whole. Although this degree of vaccination gives no guarantee for our health system uh, that it will be untroubled by the demands of COVID plus flu and RSV that I'm told are predicted for early autumn next year. But with lower vaccination rates, the system, I think, would undoubtedly fail. But we have to avoid triumphalism over vaccination rates when Māori, who are most at risk of severe illness, have been underserved by a vaccine programme that has been repeatedly criticised as inadequate 
for the needs of all those who actually want to be vaccinated. And clearly, this has to change. We must yet again return to the long-time elephant in the room as well of chronic understaffing. And again, I think we have flagged that sufficiently with the minister. In 2010, when there was an estimated 22% shortfall in senior dental and medical staff, Tony Ryle acknowledged this to the ASMS conference at the time with an affirmation that this would be dealt with. And now we're here in 2021 with an estimated 24% shortfall in staff numbers, so nothing new there really. And I've lost count as well of the times I've heard talk about doctors and dentists working in different ways or of changes to staffing models so we can work at the top of our scope all the time. And that 24 hour seven day a week models will be the new normal. Yet up to now, I think all this futuristic talk has singularly not been matched by any particular pilot schemes or with even any meaningful discussion. And I fear that for the foreseeable future, and certainly with the advent of COVID and the extreme pressures we can all anticipate, we will just face more of the same. Which translates into the DHBs and HNZ MHA relying all the more heavily on the goodwill and professionalism of all healthcare workers to compensate for the inadequacies of workforce numbers, infrastructure utility, and bed capacity. And I would ask our employers, at what point does reliance on goodwill spill over into becoming exploitation. That said, and I think exploitation is a high risk, but I also know COVID means that we will continue to go the extra mile. Why? Because our patients need us to, because we see it as our duty, and because we will not leave something as important as our patients to those who only see health as a zero-sum financial gain. I have no doubt that healthcare workers will go beyond the call of duty and members will doubtless work extra hours to the best of their ability and within the limits of their own safety and that of their whanau family. I, I make no claim that next year will be anything but tough for all of us. And at this precise point, I, I don't know what we can hope to achieve with the Mecca when faced with the rise of, rise of COVID in our hospitals and communities. But what I do know is that ASMS staff and the executive will continue to serve all members to the very best of our ability, for the welfare and well-being of our members and colleagues, to support members to be safe at work, to advocate for fairness for all members once our employer changes, to champion the systemic changes in areas like gender pay gap. And whilst all this is going on, ASMS will also continue to advocate as strongly as possible for Kiwis who have equitable, to have equitable and timely access to the healthcare they need and deserve, not just for acute coronavirus illness, but for all other morbidities that will still be there regardless of COVID. And finally, I would like to thank Sarah and all the team for supporting me and you and all my members in our day jobs. I thank you all for your membership of ASMS and for your time today. Kia ora koutou.